And with both Soviet and American nuclear arsenals at the ready, UN planners felt that the possibility of an all-out atomic war was too awful to risk. The conventional weapons of yesterday would again be brought out. By the time of the Korean War, artillery wasn't much advanced than it had been in 1939. The artillery strategy was such that we were walls back to the Great War in many ways, because the nature of the terrain in Korea meant that you couldn't use armor. Ordinary conventional towed artillery was used most of the time. And artillery just went back to the days of the Great War. It was trench warfare all over again. Traditional high explosives powered the U.S. war machine in its relentless assault against North Korea. The huge stockpiles left from World War II were brought into the conflict. Though the atomic bombs were left in storage during Korea, the development of nuclear weapons, the final word in explosives, went on. But America held a monopoly on the power of the atom for just three years. Then, in 1948, the Soviet Union tested their first atomic device, and the nuclear arms race was underway. The testing of the first hydrogen bomb upped the ante. With new weapons five million times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb, the priority was to find a way to deliver them to the heart of Russia. Whereas vast fleets of bombers were available in World War II, the Cold War found small numbers of nuclear bombers, but they had to be big, fast, and able to penetrate hostile Soviet airspace. In the 1950s, it was decided that the best way of carrying the nuclear weapon, the ultimate strategic deterrent, was to carry it in bomber aircraft. American bomber technology had reached a pinnacle with the eight-engine B-52, the Stratofortress. It's the classic American post-war bomber. Soon, small fleets of B-52s, half of which were in the air at any given time, were ready to defend U.S. soil in the event of a Soviet attack. But an even faster and more deadly method of attack was in development. The intercontinental ballistic missile could vaporize a Russian city in under 20 minutes. Falling from space at supersonic speeds, it was an unstoppable terror. But even as plans for atomic war on a vast scale were being drawn up, ideas were also being considered for smaller, more limited nuclear engagements. Atomic Annie was a 240 millimeter gun produced in the United States um, during the 1950s. It was unusual in design, it had a, a twin tractor unit, but the main difference was, as far as the gun was concerned, it fired an atomic projectile, it was just an oversized gun. In fact, it was so big and so heavy, it was difficult to move and it fell out into disuse, not because it was an atomic gun, but because it was such a bitch to move. The search resumed for stealthier, more mobile ways to deliver a nuclear punch. The superpowers turned again to the submarine. They are equipped with the latest technology in terms of computers, in terms of sonar systems, listening devices, and in weapon systems. Not only do they carry torpedoes, they also carry missiles which can be launched submerged to attack surface targets. They're an all-round weapon system. They're the capital ships of the conventional Navy. Able to launch just offshore from the Soviet Union, a single American submarine could now launch a missile attack equivalent to almost 140,000 fully loaded B-17 bombers. It was the single most destabilizing development of the Cold War. When the United States entered the war in Vietnam, it found itself in an all too familiar place. Caught in a regional undeclared war, it had to restrain its nuclear might and return to the use of conventional weapons. Once more, high explosive bombs, shells and explosives would go to war. For the wholesale delivery of explosives, the B-52 nuclear bomber was assigned to a new role and soon the Stratofortress was used in anger for the first time. 
Able to carry over 70,000 pounds of conventional high-explosive bombs, the Mammoth planes delivered more explosives to North Vietnam than were dropped on all of Europe during the Second World War. It's devastating. A good box will kill everything in it for a distance of a mile in length and 1,500 feet wide. 324 weapons in that area in 15 seconds. For a, uh, an enemy infantryman on the ground, it was absolutely, positively a terrorist weapon. It had to be a terrorist weapon because they couldn't hear us. All they could hear was, would be five seconds before impact, the scream of the bombs coming down. And uh, so the impact would occur before they could even take a breath. But it was one unique conventional bomb that was the climax of high explosives in Vietnam. Called Big Blue 82, it was a blockbuster that caused injuries for miles. At 15,000 pounds, a single bomb was the entire cargo for the journey into hostile airspace. Delivered from the hold of a C-130 cargo plane, the bomb was slowed by a parachute and drifted to its target. When it exploded, the crater was enormous and the destruction total. It remains the single largest conventional bomb dropped on enemy forces at any time. During Operation Desert Storm, B-52s delivered 40% of all the bombs dropped by coalition forces. Modern marvels, high explosives, will return in a moment. We now return to high explosives on modern marvels. When the United States rushed to rescue tiny Kuwait from an Iraqi attack in 1990, the precise delivery of a staggering array of high explosives was key to success. Once again, the doomsday weapons were left in their silos. This war would be won with the ultra-accurate, long-range delivery of conventional weapons deep behind enemy lines. Tomahawk cruise missiles epitomized the high-tech, long-range weapon. In the Gulf War of 1991, we launched almost 300 land-attack Tomahawk missiles. They proved very effective. The Tomahawks came across the countryside at 20, 30 feet, at only a few hundred miles an hour. And they could actually see and even photograph the Tomahawks coming down the roads. As the missile flies over the land, its radar looks down, compares the terrain with what's on its digitized tape. When they match, it knows it's going the right direction. Once the missile electronically sights its target, it then uses another guidance system which cuts in and guides it to within literally a few feet of the aim point. Along with the Tomahawk, smart bombs dropped from F-117 stealth fighters knocked out high priority targets with surgical accuracy. The delivery of high explosives had reached a new and unprecedented level of precision. Smart bombs are guided to their targets via a laser beam from the attacking aircraft. Correcting its trajectory as it falls, it is able to home into within a few feet of its designated point of impact. No site in Iraq was safe as America owned the skies. In contrast to these high-tech weapons, 
the MLRS, or Multiple Launch Rocket System, gave new life to the unguided rocket. This distant relative of the ancient Chinese rocket depends less on pinpoint accuracy and more on massive firepower. The 8-inch diameter rockets it fires each carry 600 bomblets in their warhead. One rocket can cover a football field-sized area with instant devastation. It's a complement to artillery, but it is a counter-battery weapon, or an interdiction weapon. It can fire rockets over 30 kilometers and cover large areas. You can knock out an artillery, an enemy battery. You can knock out the supply area. You can knock out tanks in the, when they're still in the formation stage before they make an attack. But even in this age of high-tech massive firepower, there is no replacement for the accuracy of hand-placed high explosives. It is for this role that the Marines of Camp Pendleton train daily. Today, Charlie Company will attempt to take out a simulated enemy position with high explosives. There's a bunker or an objective on top of a hill, and we got to assault through uh, some uh, barriers of uh, concertina wire and barbed wire and engineer stakes and uh, rough terrain to get to the objective to take out the objective. The objective? A hilltop fortification surrounded by trenches and barbed wire. Bangalore torpedoes, joined sections of pipe filled with high explosives, are inserted through the barbed wire obstacles under the cover of smoke grenades. Second squad moves up, laying 40-pound satchel charges to clear the last ramparts of enemy resistance. Finally, the objective is taken and the exercise complete. This sort of training paid dividends in Desert Storm, where the munitions man still had a job to do. One squad would go to a bunker and then we would um, come up real slow first and then we'd check it out, look inside the bunker. We find any munitions inside the bunker, make sure there isn't any um, prisoners, any, any prisoners in there or any soldiers. And then we use, sometimes we use grenades, sometimes we use satchel charges. Or we'll go in and we'll um, prime up some explosives and we'll blow it in place. we we'll go from bunker to bunker. Desert Storm was the zenith of the fast, ultra-accurate delivery of both large and small amounts of chemical explosives. It was a reminder that large-scale conventional warfare is still a possibility, and one that must be prepared for.